All right, let's break down the deal of this thing, right? So we got three big points today. It's the deal, the gotchas, and the result. And as we're building an investor buy box, it's going to help us be a more seasoned investor, even as starting out as a beginner. Joey, what is the first thing that someone needs to consider under the deal? Man, I'll, I'll tell you, I think a couple of things just right off the bat that either make it a fit or not is you got to know what sort of offering type it is. So if you're not an accredited investor, there's certain deals that literally just, you can't even play it, right? You can't even go there if you're not an accredited investor. So that would be number one, in my opinion. And then the second thing, this is, you know, and I don't want to limit you, but I think at least as a beginner, the amount to get into the deal, there's certain minimums. And if that's a hundred thousand and you have 50,000, obviously that's an immediate, like, Hey, we can't move beyond a and B here. Like those are the first two things that I would say are, are either make or breaks. Well, one of the things though, with, with that second one though, and we've had Travis Smith with Tribest come on and he shares at our, at our inner circle live event almost every time. How maybe though, Joey, the amount doesn't have to be a deal breaker, meaning that you and I have invested in a lot of deals that were $100,000 minimums and how you and I went 50 50s on them, right? That's so true. It, maybe you have to build a tribe in order to invest in the deal. So don't let that be the deal breaker. I'm just saying, like, if you're, if this is the first deal you've ever done, you're not going to go raise money with friends and say, hey, let's just all just, you know, take a stab at it kind of thing. Um, that That's what I would say. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I would, but I mean, I get it. Like, that's my profile. That's my investor DNA. I know my investor DNA. That's another episode. If you don't know what that is, go check out one of the episodes we've done on how to build an investor DNA. But where does this investor buy box land for us? It always comes back to helping us sort the different opportunities that come across our our, our plate, right? Some of us have not had enough at bats. We haven't had enough reps and we need to see more deals. So we understand. And what you're breaking down is there's different types of deals. There's uh, accredited versus not accredited deals. There's deals that require a uh, certain amounts of money. What else would you add into this investor buy box as we're building this for ourselves, Eric, and we want to know how do I how do I start to sort, right? Because this is should be the framework I lay on top of every deal to understand whether or not it makes sense for me. What else would you add in there? I, I want to go back to the money required really, really quickly. This is Investor 201 for everybody out there. If the deal does say a minimum is 100000 but you've got 50, 75000 if you really like this deal for all the reasons we're about to list, go ahead and call that operator or syndicator because almost never seen a time where they wouldn't lower that minimum when you call and ask. So that's just uh, that's a 201, 201. A <laughs> hey, great point, great point. Russ, I think length of the deal can be really, really important. How long is your money going to be tied up? And uh, you know, just how long the deal lasts can be really, really important. Yeah, so break that down for somebody. Okay, we're talking potentially to beginners. What is a typical, you know, length of a deal? What what would somebody expect to to try to if I'm trying to filter through this, what are expectations and timelines that I'm trying to set going into it? I don't even know what a typical deal length would be. Yeah, good question, Russ. If we're talking about a syndication deal, a lot of those deals are probably five years, but three to five is a good time period. And then you're gonna want to know when you get your return of principal. You know, we'll talk a bit a little bit more about cash flows probably in one of the next sections, but three to five years is usually a typical deal. Okay. And, and that's important because as you're trying to build this investor uh, buy box, what you're trying to say is, hey, I want to, before I ever have a deal in front of me, I want to be able to look at this unemotionally, right? I want to be able to apply logic to the situation because as deals come, <laughs> you're going to get excited. Speaking to myself here, I, I'm going to listen to this podcast and remind myself about this in a little bit, is that we get excited and emotion it over, overrides some of the logical decision-making unless we have it in place. So when we built this investor buy box and you're able to see some of these 
oh, I decided that I was only going to get in deals that were five years long or younger or, you know, shorter because of my expected outcome and goals and everything else I'm setting, then you can say, hey, this deal is a 10-year deal. I'm out. It just doesn't fit my investor buy box. I, and this ultimately, I think whenever we're, we're going into building this investor buy box, the first question we're trying to ask ourselves is, what is the goal? What is the goal that we have set for ourselves so that when we're saying, hey, I've set a goal that, you know, I'm not going to do deals with other people or I'm only going to do deals with other people, right? right? So I'm only going to find partnership deals. So that way, when I go into it, I'm only going to do deals uh, that are uh, for accredited investors because of this, this, and this. I'm going to come into that scenario understanding what those different opportunities are so I could better set myself up. Hey, maybe in your investor buy box as it revolves around the deal itself, is I'm only going to do deals that are in a specific niche, right? Maybe you're in the real estate space. You're like, I understand real estate. Yeah, I'm, I've been working in and around this world. I've been invested in this world. So I'm only going to do real estate deals. I don't care if Joey brings me hundred unicorns in one. I'm just not doing it. Like I'm not. I'm not going to jump into that deal because it's outside of the niche. Your loss. Maybe that's you're all I'm saying, Russ. That's your loss. <laughs> but maybe within the deal, you're saying, hey, I'm only going to uh, focus on opportunities that are in a certain geographical distance from me because I want to physically go see them. Or, yeah. hey, I don't care where they're located. That's not a big deal for me. This is what the types of things you're putting in that, that deal section of your investor buy box are trying to think through time, length, money, niche. Um, the geographic uh, location of where all of these things are. And the one that I haven't mentioned that I love so much, and this is this comes from one of uh, our mentors, Sharon Shrivatsa, he talks about the options. And I'm not talking about the uh, earmuffs, Wall Street stuff here. I'm talking about options, meaning what are the different ways in which I can make money in this thing? What are the different ways I can get involved in this? What are the different options of exit strategies within this deal? The options a lot of times make the deal, right? Like you may say something that like, oh, as we start talking about, well, how much money am I going to have to put into it, right? Well, is there a way that maybe I can, instead of putting in 100000 as you said, Eric, I may be able to go and creatively create something else. Well, what if I put in 50000 but I, I provide some advisory you know, time to this deal, meaning like I'm an expert in this space. Maybe I'll bring some advisory options to the deal and that can then give me some sweat equity for the extra 50. Oh, is that available? I didn't even know if that was an option, right? Like, so uh, for some people who are building their own tribe, hey, what if I have the option to bring a million dollars into this deal versus a hundred thousand into this deal? Are there some options out there for us to get extra points on this thing? You know, can we can we get a different uh, class share where we can get more um, depreciation or we can get more on the waterfall and the split on the back end? What are the options? The options tend to make the deal sweeter if we understand it. All right, so let's keep moving down this investor buy box. The next area really is trying to figure out kind of what are those gotchas, if you will? What are the risks around the deal that I need to understand what are you going to put inside of that portion of your buy box as you're building a joint? Well, I, I think it, it really starts with the due diligence process. And this is something that if you haven't got a process to do deal, due diligence, you are really going blindly into a deal. And I'm, I'm just going to tell you, due diligence is involved. Eric and I were talking about this ahead of time. And I said, man, so few of us actually stop and just do this one thing. I'm just going to give you one little tip here. Who are the general partners on the deal? And have you just done this very cursory review in Google and said, Russ Morgan is a general partner on this deal. What in do the search Russ Morgan fraud, Russ Morgan bankruptcy, Russ Morgan fill in the blank with whatever negative thing that could be associated with their name. And you say, oh my goodness, look at all these articles. Look at all these, these court cases that are referenced, whatever about that person. Do you think at that point, if you just did that one thing and you found something, it would save you 
a heartache of issues. I mean, that is the the very simplest thing that we're in, involving in our due diligence playbook. But man, if you don't have that, you are asking for trouble. All right? uh, the, the, not only the operator, but the fund itself. I've seen two different times over the last 15 years where the deal itself had a an issue with a state securities uh, department. And, and the person who was promoting the deal was like, yeah, well, that was in this state. You know, they've got these harsh requirements. We, ne- we neglected to file specifically for there. Like it's been good in all those other states. That's just one little issue. And it's like, they give you like this plausible argument. Like you're like, oh, well, that makes sense. And in both those deals I've seen, both of those deals were bad deals, right? It, there was red flags that were kicking off to certain states that were able to catch it. Those other ones just hadn't seen it yet, right? There was so many things flying around. So yes, putting in lawsuit, bankruptcy, scam, put their operator's name, put the um, the the actual um, you know sponsor or the the name of the deal's name in there. You're going to potentially find stuff out there that will just help you weed it out. Like there's so many deals. What I want, what the three of us want to convey to you, the beauty of this investor buy box is that it's going to help you filter out all the stuff that you don't want. And it's going to identify what you do. And you will never have to worry about there not being enough things, right? It we There's so many deals. There's not just one. You're not going to miss out on one deal. And it's going to be the, the difference maker for you. Eric, what a, and by the way, I mentioned, didn't mention this, but if you don't have a due diligence playbook, therein lies an opportunity. Like we've done podcasts on this. We've also, we cover this in our passive income masterminds as we go through and build out our due diligence playbook. You got to have something like that in your, in your back pocket that helps you filter through. There's a whole checklist of things just on, and Joey, you just touched on the very tip of it. Oh yeah. All right. Eric, what are some of the other gotchas? Yeah, I think the Bible tells us, you know, who goes to build a tower without first counting the cost. I'll give you a personal example of that when it comes to the area of how involved or uninvolved do you want to be in this investment? A, a year ago, I started an investment that I get, I got really excited about because you start hearing other people have success and you start honestly hearing their returns and their results. And so you, I, I get really, really excited and the shiny objects start happening all around me. And before truly counting the cost and understanding my buy box of needing to have primarily mailbox money and nothing else added to my plate of things I needed to do, I jumped in with both feet. <laughs> and I got about, you know, two miles down the wrong road and realized I've got to turn around and go back because I cannot do a good job in this business in the current situation. I mean, I should have counted the cost about how much time it was going to take. So an important part of your investor buy box is to consider, is am I the type of person that has time, resources to get involved and help influence, uh, influence and um, this business? Or do I need to bend towards more of an uninvolved mailbox money, truly passive investment? Very critical. Yeah, the the involvement uh, in a deal would probably have saved you from uh, the unicorns, wouldn't it, Stallion? Hey, look, can we can we move on? This, this is not in the buy box, okay? Well, it, no, this is a great, this is, I mean, I know I love to beat up on you, but the point of be- beating up on you is for you listening is to say, without a buy box, you make dumb decisions. Well, it, but, but to add to that, Russ, I'm going to go ahead and take the other gotcha. The reason why we include the investor DNA in our Ignite coaching program and in all of our masterminds is because if you don't know what sort of investor you are and what resources are required from a time, money, sales skills, all the things that we talk about in our investor DNA profile, then you are likely doing exactly what Eric just explained. And to your point, what I did with hundred unicorns, I literally did not realize how much of an operator you have to become to run that sort of an online drop shipping business. Mm. And it completely overwhelmed me. 
I lose, I lost money over and over again, trying to figure out things I didn't understand. And yeah, to your point, your investor DNA is the biggest gotcha that should lead all of this, right? I mean, the deal, the results, everything should start with that investor DNA. And um, I'm glad we're talking about it because if you haven't got it, you have an opportunity. If you've listened to our show for any length of time, you've heard us talk about infinite banking and how we were able to use that concept to create over $50,000 a month in passive income. But it's just not that easy to figure out how does this all connect into my own personal system? Stallion, that's why we created the passive income operating system, bro. It shows you how to turn active income into passive income it makes all the steps come together if you would like to get access to it as a podcast listener we've never given this away in public before go to whatswhatwallstreet.com forward slash p-i-o-s there was nothing worse than walking into class when you're in school and the teacher saying pop quiz day why because you were unprepared are you unprepared though for financial freedom don't be. Find out how close you are by taking our 30 second quiz at wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash quiz. Yeah. Investor DNA is the first thing that you should do prior to building a buy box because you have to know who you are and the types of things that you're going to be interested in based upon the way that God made you. And then you start building out an investor buy box and you start to assess the risk, right? There's a great way to, to assess risk is what is the level of involvement that you can have in the deal itself? And when I invest, typically, I like to have the ability to influence the outcome in some way. That doesn't mean that every deal that we're in, I can, you know, the land flipping stuff, Joey, right? Like we, we're completely hands off. It's 30K a month right now, a passive uh, gross and 20 something net. But what, what do I feel like I can influence in that? Well, we, we spend, I don't know, 20 hours, 30 hours every quarter with the land geek and the operators, right. At, at going through their boot camps and, and spending time with those uh, individuals and uh, learning other people that are in that space and learning what they're doing. So I'm always feeling like I'm building out operators. <laughs> you know, I'm building a relationship with operators in the event that every if something went wrong with the operator of, of our deal, I feel like I, I could call 10 people pretty shortly and move property over. I feel like there's an opportunity. That's how I can influence the outcome. Or when we were doing the short-term rental business, it was all about, okay, well, we can go out and help market the deal. We can be the one adding managerial and marketing expertise and operational expertise and financial expertise into the space. So I've always figuring out the, the, the higher the risk is the, the least I know about it and the least I have the ability to touch this outcome. Would, would you guys add anything to risk there? Well, I want to, I want to give you credit for something, Russ. You literally yesterday, we were talking to somebody about an investment. And you asked a very critical question that if you learn nothing from today's podcast, this one question can help you assess risk in any deal. You ask the guy, what? How do I lose all my money in this deal? Mm -hmm. what, what a great question. Because it makes that person, the operator, the person selling the deal, pitching, whatever, have to tell you more than what's on the page. Right. And that, yeah. that's a critical thing because what you don't know will end up biting you in the butt. And when they start talking, you have to listen really closely. What is the actual risk? When does the money get put at risk? How do I lose it all? How do I have, is it all at risk or is a portion of it? That's just a very telling question. And uh, I, I just think that that's, that's a great way to lead into this. Eric, what would you add? I would just say that, like Russ was talking about, really and you were just talking about have a conversation with the operator or with the business partner that you're planning on giving your your hard-earned resources to you know those dollars are so hard to come by um the hours in your day are impossible to replicate that once we use them they're going forever ask really really good questions for an example 
if you're about to make an investment with somebody that's doing a mobile home park and you ask them, how many times have you successfully done this? Oh, we've been doing this for 10 years. We've always crushed it. Where are those? Oh, all the successful ones have been in Birmingham, Alabama. But wait, this investment, this deal you're doing is in Portland, Oregon. Maybe it's not the same. Right. So when we ask good questions, we find out more about the investment. Doesn't mean we don't do it, but at least we are uncovering and pulling apart that investment. Because I have been on the excited end of an investment that turned very unexciting two, three, four years later to where I didn't get my return of principal or any income from the deal. It's not a good place to be. You wished you had asked more questions. No, I'm, I'm going to transition this to the third point. So we, first we broke down inside your investor buy box. You need to consider the deal, right? The mm -hmm. the niche, the money required, the geographical area, the, the type of offering, the options, the length, the, all that. Uh, we went through the gotchas, the risk, the due diligence, investor DNA, uh, uninvolved versus involved. But I think uh, one of the risks that can be identified or mitigated early on is also as we get to the, the so what? What's the result, right? Eric, you said that um, so wisely at the beginning that if the first thing you're doing is asking about returns and talking about returns, you're at the wrong. So that's why we put results at the back end of our buy box. Yeah. But results are important. We need to understand what those results are. And for Joey, I know one of the things for him, he will consider a deal risky if it doesn't produce cash, cash flow. flow. <laughs> right? Cash flow quickly. I am not in for a deal that you're saying, man, I promise you in 24 to 36 months, we're going to possibly see some cash flow. I love you. I love the deal. It sounds amazing. But what are we, it, it, this goes back to the goal. Is the goal for me to be financially free? If so, then I need to constantly be pushing my passive income number above my monthly expenses. If I now have to wait two to three years for the possibility of that cash flow to start, that takes that capital out of the game to get me to financial freedom as fast as possible. And as you mentioned before, there are a million deals out there. And if you don't believe me, that's because you're not in the right rooms. Our rooms are full of deals. Every mastermind that we have, every, every one of our uh, Ignite coaching program participants are getting more deal access because they're in the rooms with other investors. And I'm telling you, you they are there. The ones that produce the cash flow you want today are there. And even if you like the other one, it doesn't help you get to your goal. So that to me is the result that I'm looking for. And so many of the people in our community are. Eric, when you're considering building out your buy box from a result standpoint, what else is going into that? I love the cash flow piece so much that I want to talk about that just one second more. If you don't have that cash flow coming in on a regularly scheduled interval, it's almost hard to measure how well the investment is doing because you might get quarterly reports or annual reports. And let's be honest, we're very busy. Somebody sends us a report that's just eight pages full of numbers. Sometimes it's hard to ferret out how well this investment's really doing. But when you have an expectation of a certain dollar amount hitting your bank account every month, you talk about a scorecard that you can measure. The day it doesn't hit your bank account that it's supposed to, you're on that phone. Hey, what's going on? Absolutely. So a great way to measure your results. I want to know, similar to cash flow, Russ, is rather than return on principle, I want to know when is my return of principle. How quickly am I going to get my invested dollars back, which means my risk is almost removed and I have the opportunity to go and find and do another deal. So that return on principle for me is just huge. Yeah, it, that definitely is a, a, a real value. The quicker you can get your chips off the table, right? Like Wall Street is all about gambling. I, I think of you know going to the casino, most of the time our money's constantly on the table it's constantly at risk and that's the way it is with wall street but when we can find deals that potentially can return our principal quickly and then it's no more of our money in that deal and like you said we can now leverage that dollar to be doing two things that's why we love infinite banking 
right? We get to have two things potentially at work for us. We can have the insurance contract at work and we can have been, you know, we can have used those cash values of borrowing us those cash values to do another deal. And it could be working. Well, what if we could get our money back out of that deal, put it in another deal and another deal, right? It's you get, you get return, you get a return, you get a return, right? It's like the Oprah <laughs> uh, of deal making here. I love this. Uh, one of the other things I would say that goes into mind is I want to understand the tax efficiency of the investment. And, you know, depending on how you're, uh, you're, you're being compensated, you might be a W-2 employee, you might be uh, receiving lots of 1099s and K-1s. And, and so we need to really understand um, what is the type of income that we're paying tax on? Do we pay tax on lots of ordinary income or do we, we pay tax on lots of passive income? That helps us match up the deals that we're getting into that potentially could offset, right, some of those different taxes, right? So when I understand the types of taxable incomes I may have, I can look for potential deals that might be able to offset some of those types of taxation because really it goes back to how much money we make, um, but it is important, but how much money we keep is vital. That's the measurement. Yeah. Now, what one of the things that we did we didn't mention in here that happens is there's there's opportunities in these deals for multiples on the back end. And talk a little bit about that real quickly, Joey, as we wrap up the results part of what for a beginner who doesn't even understand what that looks like. What are we talking about when we talk about equity and getting something out on the back end? Well, there's lots of variations here, um, and I'll I'll go ahead and quote um, a '90s song by saying, "Don't go chasing waterfalls." You know, at the end of the day, um, but you hear the word waterfall and it's all about what happens on the back end. We've gotten this deal. It's created X amount of cash flow, whatever that may have been or not. And then all the back end, when we sell, there's a percentage of the ownership that goes to you as a limited partner. And then the people who are operating the business, the general partnership. And in some cases, uh, there really is no like right or wrong with this. It really is about aligning the proper expectations. Okay. And, and I've seen it from the standpoint where, man, as a, as a limited partner, we only get 15% on the back end and the general partners get 85. Well, but that's because they're willing to pay you a lot more on the front end mm-hmm. cash flow and otherwise something like that. So if that's what you're more, you know, prone to desire in an investment, the the equity splits on the back end may not be that big of a deal. But in other cases, you say, man, I really am willing to give up a little bit of cash flow today to have a much bigger upside because I see the business plan here. And to your point earlier, I feel like I could maybe even help influence the outcome a little bit or whatever the case may be. And I really want to see man, a major return on the back end. So I'm just saying you need to understand what that is and make sure that it fits your buy box um, just so you don't get into the deal and say, wait a minute, uh, this isn't what I expect. Well, as we wrap this up, I'm, I'm hopeful that you were able to get some insights. If you haven't already started down the path of building a buy box, maybe you you need someone to to walk you through this process. I don't know if you know this, but we help people ignite their passive income. You heard Joey talk about our Ignite coaching program. This is a process where you have a one-on-one coach specifically for you that meets with you multiple times throughout the month, helps you be involved in a small mastermind, keeps you focused on what are you trying to accomplish and how are you going to get there, and unlock some of those doors for you that maybe have been closed because you just didn't have experience or you didn't have focus toward this thing. What you track grows. But what you track and report on grows exponentially. So not only do we want to give you an ability to start tracking passive income and monthly expenses, but I also give you a group of people that you can start reporting it to so that you can see that uh, exponential growth as you go down the road. Uh, Gentlemen, thank you so much for adding so much value as you always do. Thank you for listening to this episode. We, uh, If this is the kind of stuff that you're like, man, I need more of this in my life, just just take a screenshot of, of whatever you're listening to this on and just post it on one of the uh, social channels that you're on and just tag What's About Wall Street. It helps Joey and I to know 
that this is the kind of content you want us to keep building because we we keep coming up with ideas. We just don't know what's really resonating. What's that thing that you're like, that need more of that kind of stuff. It'd be super helpful for us to do that. Have an amazing day. This has been the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the Wall Street mindset and begin building wealth on your own terms in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.